Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church. How are y'all doing today? That wasn't very convincing. Let's try it one more time. How are y'all doing today? That was better. Can we try it one more time? How y'all doing today? I think we're up to 30% now. Well, sure it's good to see all of you this morning. Let's all turn our hymnals to hymn number 136. Hymn number 136. We're going to sing the first, second, and last verse, and let's all stand while we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing crown? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you, are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Of the Lamb? Are you washed? Once again, it sure is good to see all of you this morning. Do we have any first-time visitors with us? Any first-time visitors? No first-time visitors. We all know how this works. Sit back and enjoy all that God has in store for you. I do have some news. Sir? All right. It's good to have you here. I'm sorry. The pastor's really good at that stuff. I'm not. Uh, just for information, our pastor is not with us today. You know what that means? Y'all stuck with me. But we're going to see what we can do. God is wonderful and he's going to take control of this service. Just let him touch you with all he has to say. All right. Let's open our service with a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time we can be in your house. We thank you for your love, your many blessings. Lord, you are so wonderful. You are so amazing. Lord, we praise you. We lift you up. Lord, we thank you for this day, the beautiful weather that you've provided for us. Lord, thank you for every breath that you give us, the strength that you provide us. We thank you for salvation. Lord, we pray for all those who are in leadership over us. We pray for our president, our vice president, our national, state, and local governments. Lord, bless them. Grant them wisdom. Lead them. And Lord, you know, sometimes we're just not that strong. Just as our leaders are not strong all the time. Lord, I ask you to help lead them, but Lord, help them to follow you. Help them to make the right decisions for this nation and the right decisions for your people. Lord, we pray for our military, our law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs. Lord, all those that stand in their harm's way for us, we ask you to protect them, guide them. Keep them safe. Bless them for all they do. Bless them for risking their lives every day for us. 
We pray for all, all of our local schools, Lord. Protect our children. Guide them. Be with the teachers, faculty, and staff. Lord, help them to find the best ways to teach our children. Help them to be good examples for our children. Lord, bless them. And for all those who are Christians, help them to spread your love and your word throughout our schools. Lord, we pray for all of our local churches, all those that serve the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Guide us. Be with all those who are preaching, teaching, and singing about your love and your word. Lord, we pray for all those who are on our prayer list, all those who need your touch, your healing, your strength. Lord, bless them. Grant them your mercy, and may your will be done in each life this morning. Lord, we pray for our pastor this morning. He is in revival. We ask that you bless those services there. Lord, take control. Guide him. Let him know exactly what those people need to hear, what he needs to say. And Lord, give me strength this morning. Help me to know your will, your word. Speak through me today. Lord, take control of the service. May your will be done here. Guide us all and use us to spread your love and your word to all those around us. Continue to bless this church. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask all these things. Amen. All right. <laughs> Children's Church and Junior Church, it's your time. Please come on up. And as our pastor always reminds us, don't forget, this is where the, all the snacks are. So go with them if you need snacks. Because you're not going to have any here. Can you hear them at all? Okay. Wow. All right. Let's all turn to our hymns. Hymn number 135. Hymn number 135. We're going to sing the first, second, and last verse. It's our offertory hymn. Let's all stand while we sing.
praise God. I mean, um, thank you for everyone that's here. Please give Brother David a good message. Amen. Amen.
Hi there. Well, you're not going to believe this. I told you not long ago that one thing would really thrill me. You know I'm a football fan. And you know I'm an Arkansas fan. Are you ready for this? Arkansas won a football game yesterday. They played the University of Tucson. But at least they won. And I have good news. Georgia didn't lose yesterday. They didn't play. And if the pastor was here, he would remind you that Alabama soundly won yesterday. See, y'all can get away with that because the pastor's not here, who's an Alabama fan. My wife, who's an Alabama fan, is not here. You, you go ahead. Boo. Okay. All right. Y'all ready for this? The title of this morning's sermon is The Mystery of the Twice Blessed Food. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? It won't be interesting long. Don't worry about it. There's a reason I did that, and it's just a catchy phrase, just something to get your attention, and I'll explain. Now, we're going to be in James chapter 1, if you want to go ahead and turn there. James chapter 1. Not long ago, I had this idea, and I talked to my family about it, and they said, you know, that's not really a bad idea. So we proceeded to do this, and it's just this. If anybody has to ask if we have said the blessing, then we need to say it again. We're examples. They need to see what we do, how we can serve God, even in just blessing our food. So, if anybody asks, even if my son comes down and says, did y'all bless the food? Then guess what? We're going to say a blessing again. If it's for our benefit, hey, if God will bless the food twice, we're going for it. But other people need to see how we serve God. When you go to a restaurant, do they see you bless the food? Now, I did all that to say this. Wherever you go, whatever you do, is it a mystery to other people that you're a Christian? Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see Jesus in you by the way you treat other people? Do they see Jesus by the way you talk? Or do you say those things that don't represent Jesus? How hard is it for somebody to tell that you're a Christian? Hopefully not, but, you know, there, there was something, as I was growing up, they used to say all the time, if it looks like a duck, if it acts like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. If you look like a Christian, well, that's not big. But if you act like one, if you sound like one, if you treat other people like one, then you might just be a Christian. But can they see it? So we're going to work on that day, today in James chapter 1. And it's something that's not a mystery with our pastor. He talks about it constantly. Now, I've got news for you. He says a lot of things. We should act like Christians. We should serve God like Christians. We need teachers. We need people to work in the nursery. If you can do those things, that's where we need you. And if you expect anything different this morning, you're not going to get it. Because that's where we're headed. What can we do to serve God? How can we serve God better? 
And James says quite a bit about it. So we're going to start in James chapter 1, verse 1. And James chapter 1, verse 1 says this, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now, there are no surprises here. This is the opening verse for a new book. Who's it from? Who's writing it? James. Okay. Who's he writing it to? The 12 tribes of Israel. Now, during this time, the 12 tribes of Israel are no longer a nation. They're not in one place. They're scattered in so many different countries, it's not even funny. They were in every city. Let's see, in Europe, Asia, Africa. But you know what? They maintained their own laws. They maintained their synagogues. And they kept worshiping God no matter how far out they were. And in the last part of the verse, he says, greeting. Like I said, it's the opening verse. Hi there. This is my letter. I'm writing it to all these folks. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 say this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I know you've heard this question many times. If you've been in this church, under our pastor, you've heard it a bunch of times. But it's important. Where does your joy come from? Where does your joy come from? Now, if your joy is in your car, or your house, or your football team, then it's not real joy. And you know what? It's not going to last long. Houses need repair. Cars get old. And football teams, like Arkansas, lose. Real joy only comes from one place. God himself provides us joy through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you have salvation, if you've asked Jesus to be your savior, you know what that joy is. You've experienced real joy. Don't let things of this earth, they can only make you happy for a little while. Don't think they're joy. You can enjoy them. They can make you happy for a little while, like I said, but they're not real joy. I've got to tell you, when I showed this to my wife, I usually have like four or five pages of notes, and my wife tells me, that may last 20 minutes. I showed her eight pages of notes this morning, And she said, 25 minutes. And I'm burning through them pretty quick, if you notice. I don't know. I don't know why you get up here and you expect to say something and expect it to take a few minutes to do, but it goes by really fast, especially when you're nervous, as I tend to get. But we're going to work through this all right. Okay. Now, I also told you real joy comes from God. But no matter what you face, or let me say it this way, temptations are going to come. Temptations can get in the way. But no matter what you face, God's always going to be there. He doesn't go anywhere. He's always here to help. And 1 Corinthians 10.13 says this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape, 
that ye may able to bear it. Count it all joy when you face diverse temptations. Does temptation seem like a time you should be joyful? That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? But, like I said, if your joy is in the things of this earth, when you face those temptations, they can get you down. Your strength can seem to fall away. But if your real joy is in heaven, in God, in your salvation, if that's where your joy comes from, even when you face those temptations, the joy does not go away. It's always there. Always something to lean on. That spirit inside of you, that joy inside of you, even when you're tempted, when you need strength, is there. That's what it's for. So like I said, joy from heaven is our strength. Lean on it. Trust in it. Now, most of the time when we face temptations or when we face hard times, We don't think there's another choice. And we rush into it. We make a decision quickly. That's where we fail. But in verse 3, it also says have patience. So when you face those temptations, when you don't think there's a way out, sometimes we have to wait just a little bit longer. Trust in God just a little bit longer. Wait upon the Lord. He tells us that many times. And in that patience is strength. I just told you he's always going to provide a way out. Sometimes we have to wait on God to see that other choice. And you know what? If you wait on him just a little bit longer, wait on that other choice to come around. You know, the thing that we were going to rush into, the choice that we had, all of a sudden doesn't seem quite so good. When we can see what God has in store for us, we can can see his choice. You know, most of the time things are a lot better. I face things every day at Coca-Cola. I go into work on a machine And you know, I've told you this several times. It's easy for me to fix things. That's what I do. A lot of times when I'm having trouble with something, I can't figure out what the problem was. It's hard to fix if you don't know what's wrong. Most of the time, if instead of rushing into it, trying to replace a bunch of parts because I can't figure out what's wrong, I still haven't fixed anything. But if you'll wait, ask God for help. He can show you things you don't see. Most of you have heard this story before, and I'm going to tell it to you one more time. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. I was working on a McDonald's in Elberton. And I needed a part to get it fixed. You know where our parts are? Augusta. That's an hour and 15 minutes. So I left the McDonald's, drove all the way to Augusta to get the part, and drove all the way back to McDonald's and put the part on. And guess what? There was something else wrong. And I needed a part. So I drove all the way back to Augusta, picked up the part, drove all the way back to McDonald's, put it on, and got that part working, and guess what? There was something else wrong. Every time I would fix something, I would see something else wrong. So I drove all the way back to Augusta to get another part. 
this has been a long day. And I walked into the parts room, and our parts guy is a Christian. Wonderful gentleman. And I walked there to get that part. He looked at me, he said, David, he said, uh, did you pray before you started this? <laughs> God can help us if we'll ask him. But if we don't ask, it's my fault. I didn't have to make those trips. God can help me if I'll ask. He's there to provide strength. He is joy. And when you're facing temptation, he can always help. But you know what? We have to ask. James, first, James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 say this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, before you, I know most of you have already thought this. Don't say it out loud. If any man doesn't have wisdom, I know most of you are thinking this guy's just a music director. He's not a preacher. He doesn't have the wisdom, and he's trying to teach us about it. You know what? There's another part of that verse. Yes, I may not be the wisest thing around. But God can provide wisdom to those that ask. There again, all we have to do is ask. If any of you lack wisdom, ask, and he can provide it. And I'll let me give you the rest of it. For those of who, those, I said, for those of us that don't have much, times can be hard. And maybe I don't always have the, all the answers. Maybe you come and ask me a question about the Bible, and I just don't know. But you know what? I can find it. I can find help. And God can help us understand every word in there. You're not alone. He's always there to help. Intelligence is one thing. But true wisdom is a gift. Our pastor is a wise man. He gets up here and teaches you so much. Our chairman of deacons is a wise man. He handles things better than I've ever seen anybody handle anything. It's a gift. And you know where it comes from? There again, God. So we've already talked about him providing what? Joy? Wisdom? You know, there's a big list of the things that God provides for us. And it keeps on growing just in this chapter. Now, wisdom. Wow. Wow. There are several words in there some people don't understand, like unbraideth. Do you know what unbraideth means? Does anybody know what unbraideth means? Unbraideth. It's a simple term. Hmm? Let's make it real simple. Saying something you don't mean. 
For instance, if I ask God for something, but I don't mean what I'm asking, I don't believe in what I'm asking, it's not there. Do you believe when you pray to God? Do you believe when you ask God for something? Do you believe what you're saying? Prayers are simple things. All we have to do is just say what we mean. We don't have to make it hard. We don't have to use big words. But it's kind of important to mean what you're asking for. To really ask God for something and believe that he can provide the answers. He can provide what you need. And later in the verse, it talks about wavering. Do you know what wavering is? That's a good way to say it, wishy-washy. You know, there are several places you can study the Bible, and one book that I looked in said it real funny. Wavering is like a drunken, drunken man trying to read the Bible. You're not in one place or the other. You're seeing the words, but you're not understanding them. To and fro. And then there's another word in there. It's called double-minded. Do you know what that means? That's not hard. Just like I've said before, wavering is one thing. It's to and fro. Double-minded is like a man that is in two different places. He's trying to hold on to the world, but also wants to hold on to heaven. You know what? There are so many of us that do that. We can look forward to heaven, but we're trying so hard to hold on to what's here, trying to serve the world and serve God. Which is more important to you? Which do you take time for? Do you take more time going to the movies? Spending time with family? Now, I'm not saying spending time with family is not important. But which is more important? Watching a movie or reading your Bible? Going to the grocery store or helping out next week? We need people to serve God. We need people that are willing to spend their time praying. We need people to spend their time teaching. You know, it's wonderful to sit here, and we're gonna, I'm going to get into this a little bit later. It's wonderful just to sit here in these pews and hear the wonderful stuff our pastor is teaching us. But are you using it? Are you telling others about it? You know, it seems like part of our job as a Christian is doing just that, telling somebody else about Jesus Christ. In James 1, 9 through 11, it says this, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner rising with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I'll say it real simple. Let the poor man rejoice. He knows where he's going. But the rich man, if he didn't turn to God, they both have one thing to look forward to. They're not going to be here long. But what happens afterwards? Well, the, the poor Christian, he may not have had much here on earth, but heaven is not far away. We have something to look forward to as Christians. 
Now that rich man, if he loves his money, if he loves all the things that he has and hasn't asked Jesus to be his Savior, then all that stuff is gone. And what he has to look forward to is not pleasant. Now, I'm not saying being rich is bad. But if you have that alone, that's all you have to look forward to? The end is coming quickly. And I would much rather be poor here on earth and have something to look forward to. There are so many people that believe well, I'm going to enjoy my time on earth because when I die, that's the end of it. There's nothing else. If that's what you believe, that there's nothing else, well, you better enjoy what you have. But you know what? I believe there's a lot more. I believe I have something to look forward to. And if you've, asked, if you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, the joy that we are facing is wonderful. But we still have a duty here. We still have a mission here. Yeah, we can go to a football game. Yeah, we can go to a car race. But there's a lot of joy in just doing the simple things and serving God. There's a fall festival next week. And if you think that it's just going to be boring and nobody's going to have fun, you need to come just watch. We're going to have a ball. There's joy in spending time with this family. Whether it's Brotherhood, WMU, just come spend time and see all the joy that you have, the fun that you have. Believe it or not, being a Christian can be fun too. But you've got to spend time here. You've got to see it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Experience the love of this family. Now, I know I'm leaving something out, but I didn't write it on this page, and we're just going to keep on going. James chapter 1, verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to him, to them that love him. We talked about temptation earlier, and God can help you with all the temptations you face, but you know what? It also says there's a reward here for those that resist temptation. Those that ask God for help. There's a crown of life, a blessing in resisting temptation. And it also says something else. No matter what you face, no matter what the temptation is, some of them seem like, you know, maybe this can be fun. Maybe I can enjoy this. But you know what? There's a blessing in wait for you. And it says something right at the end of the verse. For them that love him. Resisting temptation in itself is a mission. It's a job. It's not easy. But do you truly love God? Are you willing to, to fight? Not to do those things that are wrong. Are you willing to, again, ask for help when you're facing those things? Resist temptation. It's hard, but we can do it. There again, if you ask for help. In verse 13, through 16, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither therefore he tempteth any man. 
Neither tempteth he any man. Let me say it right. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when the lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. God does not tempt you with evil. He doesn't do that. So therefore, when you lust or think about those things that are wrong, when you're facing the bad things, it's not of God. It's either of Satan or, believe it or not, you. What's inside of you? You know what? We're all created the same way. We all have that one thing in us that we don't like. It's called sin. And if we let it, it'll take control. It'll run free. Try not to. How many of you can make it one day without sin? You know, it's real easy. You can do it. Grab that book that you have right there in front of you called a Bible, okay, and a flashlight, and go lock yourself in a closet for 24 hours, and you might make it one day without sin. It's not easy. And you know what? There's another part of it. Every man is tempted, every one of us. But what does temptation bring? One word, death. An end. Separation from God. That's why we have salvation. We don't have to be separated. Wow, are you ready for this? I'm glad I looked. Because I'm not done yet. You know what? We get to finish this tonight. My wife is going to be shocked. I made it past 25 minutes. Like I said, sin brings death, but we have an option. It's that little thing called salvation. An opportunity to ask Jesus, forgive us of all those things that we've done wrong. Now, if you have salvation, if you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, that's wonderful. I'm thrilled that you have. But not everybody has. If you haven't asked Jesus to be your Savior, today is a wonderful time. We have had, are you ready for this? 13 people saved and baptized in this church in the last three weeks. That's wonderful. Our church is growing, although most of them aren't here today. Probably because the pastor wasn't going to be here. I know y'all heard that, and most of the people are somewhere else. That's all right. In all that I've said today, if you have an opportunity to face one thing and get past it by asking for help, do it. If you haven't asked Jesus to be your Savior, Please come forward today. It's a perfect time. Our pastor would tell you, wait on me, I'll be here next week. Don't do it. You might not make it till next week. If you haven't asked Jesus to be your Savior, please come up here today. Brother Wayne's going to come, he's going to stand right up here, and I'm going to go over there and lead music. That's what I do best. Don't miss an opportunity. If you need anything, if you need prayer for anything, please come up here. This is your chance right now. Come on up and pray for whatever you need. If you need somebody to pray with you, 
We will get somebody here, I promise you. But like I said, don't miss this opportunity. Ask Jesus to be your Savior right now if you haven't done it. Let's pray real quick. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the service. We thank you for this place we can be to serve you, worship you, learn about you. Lord, bless this church. Guide us. Lord, if there's one here today that needs you, give them the will, the courage to step forward right now so they can hear how they can be saved. And Lord, as we leave this place here today, Lord, we are yours. Use us to spread your love and your word to all those around us. Guide us. Let us know who needs to hear about you. And Lord, help us to return to your house once again to hear about you and how we can better serve you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus Christ's wonderful name, amen.